Welcome everyone to the final lecture of the series titled Encountering Life, jointly organized by the Department of Religious Study and Religious Graduate Council and sponsored by the Institute for the Study of Humanistic Buddhism, University of West. My name is Miro Sake, Chair of the Department of Religious Study. So before we begin, I would like to request our President of the University of West, Dr. Minhua Tha, to give an opening remark and making an exciting announcement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Greeting to everyone. Uh, at the time when the pandemic isolated most of us, the religious study department have raised to the occasion to create this online lecture series to bring all of us together so we could continue to inspire by Dr. Lancaster teaching. So thank you, Dr. Lancaster. And thank you, Professor Sakia. And thank you all the faculty and staff work behind this uh, lecture series. Um, furthermore, I want to thank you for your participation in the last many months. The lecture series has been very engaging, intellectually stimulating and fulfilling because of your presence. So thank you very much. Tonight, I have a, a very special announcement um, I would like to invite all of you um, to come to our 30th anniversary celebration if you happen to be in town uh, next spring of 2022 on April 21st. Please save the day um, at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. We will be celebrating our 30th anniversary uh, and anniversary and anniversary um, and um, during the event, we have a very special ceremony to dedicate the U.S. Library to Dr. Louise Lancaster um, and the small garden to the late Mrs. Lancaster. Um, you will receive an invitation online regarding of the 30th anniversary celebration um, we are also setting up a library, Lu Dr. Louis Lancaster Library Endowment Fund. Um, so you will have the opportunity to support us if you have been enjoying this lecture series. Uh, U.S. is a nonprofit uh, education institute. So we really depend on your ongoing support. Um, please let your friend know about this opportunity and we hope to see you and welcome you to our university campus in the spring of 2022. Lastly, I want to wish everyone a blessed holiday season. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, President Ta, for sharing such a wonderful news. Uh, today, once again, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Louis Lancaster. And Dr. Lancaster is Emeritus Professor of the Department of East Asian Language at the University of California, Berkeley, and University of West. Dr. Lancaster has been offering insightful lectures on various topics of Buddhism for last 14 months nonstop. Today, this series, this second series came to an end. So I want to uh, sincerely express my gratitude and thank to Dr. Lancaster for kindly donating his time to share his valuable experience with us. It was nothing sort of excellence. It not only informed us, but also inspired and motivated us. Just as the first series, the second series also has also positively impacted our lives. So I have been so fortunate to host these two series. The topic of today's lecture is self, active and passive isn't. According to Buddhist doctrine, there is no impermanent and underlying substance in human uh, that can be called the self. Instead, the individual is compounded of five factors in Pali, Khanda, Sanskrit, Skanda, that are constantly changing. So in today's talk, Dr. Lancaster will offer a fresh perspective on self and what do Buddhism say about self. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Lancaster. Thank you very much. Uh... Rose, and thank you, President Ta, and thank you for the great honor of having the library named after me. I, I, I'm very overwhelmed by that. That's 
A wonderful gift. Thank you so much. Well, this, this is the last of the monthly talks dealing with Buddhist thought as it is expressed in the contemporary world. Uh, the goal has, has been to explore the relevance of Buddhist teachings in light of our current understanding of human experience. And this goal has meant that we must move beyond the study of Buddhism limited to the confines of Indian history. It's my view that the relevance of, of many of the Buddhist teachings concerning perception and cognitive thought will become significant in today's world only when they are compared to what we now know about the brain and its functions as found in neuroscience. In keeping with such an approach, I have chosen for this final talk, one of the most important and controversial doctrines of Buddhism. That is the denial of a permanent and unchanging self. I'm only going to deal with one example of how we can understand the nature of an autonomous agent, a self. My question is, what happens when an action of body, speech, and mind occurs? The impact of this question is to determine whether there is a conscious self that is in control of an act. Well, let me, let me set the scene for the discussion and then return to the question. This, this is an attempt to describe 20th century individuals who became interested in Buddhism and how they approached the notion of a self. When I first became aware of the Buddhist tradition, it was the era of the so-called beat generation. That is the years following World War II. Those who identified themselves as beat were expressing their anguish in the aftermath of a destructive war and acts of unspeakable harm visited on humans and carried out by humans. My country was filled with those who had served in the armed forces, many with valor and purpose. When I went to college in the late 1940s as a young and naive teenager, Many of the students were called GIs, and they were taking advantage of free education, which was offered to all returning veterans. Now, among them were those who had suffered what we now call post-traumatic syndrome. Few received any psychological support for their difficulties in adjusting back to civilian life. They were indeed beat. Now, Buddhism was of interest to one segment of those who identified themselves as beat. It was not any form of Buddhism that had existed before. These beat Buddhists were seeking to escape from their emotional demons and the doctrine of emptiness in Buddhism suited their sense of being. That they were questioning any idea of meaning in a world that followed the sufferings of battlefields and the horror of the Holocaust. The Buddhist teaching of emptiness was seen by them to reject any attempt to give merit to rules and regulations. They saw this 
as a potential freedom from cultural mores and controls of the society. A society that had failed, had failed to avoid the disasters of the war. For them, freedom was seen as the goal of emptiness. Where society had failed, the last resort was the individual and a heightened sense of self. Ironic that Buddhism with its teachings of the lack of a permanent self found a niche in the post-war scene as a way to achieve enhancement of self. Well, I witnessed another form of self enhancement in Buddhism in Korea. The site of the extended battle between the US, Russia and China from 1950 to 53, when the Cold War flared for a time into a full blown encounter of armed troops. I made my first trip to Korea in 1969, when it was still recovering from the massive destruction caused by the military actions that touched nearly every corner of the peninsula. My experience in Korea was a surprise. Before I went, I read the only three books in the Berkeley Library on Korean Buddhism. They gave me a dim view of the tradition. Two of the books were in English, written by Christian missionaries, and one was in Japanese, done during the occupation of Korea as a colony. The bias is represented in the volumes by missionaries and a Japanese colonial official were stark. What I saw when I arrived in South Korea was nothing like what these limited publications had described. I thought I, thought I, I was going to see the ruins of an ancient tradition that had sunk into near oblivion. Instead, I found a vigorous community of practicing monks and nuns. To my further surprise, a number of the young monastics had entered the order after studying in college. So this, this raised a number of questions and I began to interview the community. One of my questions was, what influence led you to this practice? At the same time, I also asked the students enrolling in my undergraduate course on the Berkeley campus. What influence led you to take this course? Well, nearly half of both groups, Buddhist students, Berkeley students, sorry, and Korean monastics said they had read and been inspired by Herman Hesse's volume Siddhartha. Now, Hesse may not have accurately described Shakyamuni Buddha, but he masterfully captured the narrative of a young man seeking to find himself and express his selfhood in the most productive fashion. It's still a favored and helpful volume for young adults who are struggling with life's challenges. Once again, just as with the beat generation, these readers of Siddhartha were not seeking Buddhism as a way to deal with the lack of an essential self. Rather, it was considered, Buddhism was considered as a pathway to achieving enhanced selfhood. 
Well, then in the decades from that last half of the 20th century until now, much has happened to our understanding of the nature of ourselves and our experiences. In particular, there has been a major shift in understanding the nature of our brains in the field of neuroscience. Scientists have put forward research and the findings of that research challenge many aspects of the notion of a self or free will. The first indication that the research on the brain would question the very essence of the concept of a self came in the work of Professor Benjamin Levet in the 1980s. He spotted that the pattern of brain activity prior to an act was not conscious thought and was not under the control of an autonomous agent, a self. The brain functions in that moment just before an act were found to exist only in the lipic system of the brain, a part that does not operate with conscious thought. Now, let me give you this in terms of what I've learned about my personal life. <laughs> it puzzled me to read that one researcher had determined how to spot a college student from the southern part of the US whose ancestry was from England and Scotland. <laughs> it was a rather elaborate experiment. Students who were taking a final exam were asked to allow their blood pressure to be monitored before entering the building. And again, during the exam, now, prior to entering the exam room while walking down the corridor, half of them were forcefully pushed by large men. These men then shouted a curse rather than an apology to the ones they pushed aside so rudely. 20 minutes later, during the exam, blood pressures were taken Again, one group of students had elevated readings while others had a reading similar to the initial test. What the researchers found was that those who had higher blood pressure reading 20 minutes after the shove were all raised in the South descended from lineages originating in Scotland and England. Now these results were replicated a number of times. Students from other parts of the country and different cultural heritage took the event in stride. And 20 minutes later had a normal blood pressure. And the same was true for Southerners who had other ancestry. The conclusion has been that the cultural ties go back to herders and pastoralists who lived in clans with a defined way of surviving that involved a sense of honor and respect. Well, this interested me because it is precisely my background. I grew up in Virginia with my ancestors coming from Scotland and England. It was a revelation to read this research. Since I have lamented that I'm greatly bothered by what I take to be impoliteness. 
why I've asked myself over the years, am I so thin skinned? Why does having anger and disrespect directed toward me causes me so much discomfort? Well, from the research, it would appear that my discomfort is not from conscious thought, but from the lipid part of my brain that still bears cultural influences from centuries ago. Another study gives me further information about myself. The amygdala part of the brain system controls the emotions associated with memories of fearful stimuli. For those who live in cities, it's not so hard to comprehend that their amygdala is larger than those who are from rural environments. Well, I grew up on a farm in a peaceful environment, free of moments of fear. And so my limbic system probably is slower to react to signs of danger than someone who has lived their whole life in Los Angeles. But these are examples of how we think we are acting as a free agent. A free agent with a conscious will that controls our actions. But in fact, it does not appear to be true. Action is first generated in the limbic system of the brain and conscious thought comes later. For example, if I'm playing tennis, I think to myself, ah, here comes the ball, get ready, now hit it. This is the implication of a conscious self which is directing my arm and body to respond in such a way as to return the volley. But in neuroscience, evidence about the function of my brain in milliseconds of time says my limbic system was given has given the command for my arm to move forward to meet the oncoming ball before I had any conscious thought to do so. If I wait for a conscious thought to initiate my swing, I'll never be in time to make a single score. Now we see this on accidents on the freeway. If a car swerves in front of me and suddenly stops, I will not survive if I rely on conscious thought to tell me, hey, Lou, a car has suddenly stopped in front of you. You must quickly push on the brake. Well, fortunately, action is triggered before I can think it. My reason for bringing this to your attention is to say that the greatest support for the Buddhist assertion that there is no singular autonomous self that initiates action is coming from neuroscience. The research is giving compelling evidence that our behavior is the result of an incredible, complex array of multiple, multiple factors. And these factors function without our conscious direction or control of them. The idea that my conscious self is in charge of starting an action turns out to be false. Now, the neurological 
research shows, I may have the experience of thinking that I am in total control of my tennis stroke, breaking in an emergency or reacting to an insult. However, this experience is deceptive. It now appears that what I experience as myself directing the first moment of action is a concept that is made after the beginning of an action. Well, this evidence about how an act originates has been at the heart of research for Professor Sapolsky of Stanford University. His decades of study of the functioning brain have produced compelling evidence that actions and emotions are connected to chemical processes within the brain that are not consciously controlled. Now he asserts there's nothing in his testing that can support the idea of free will or an agent that is conscious, consciously controlling the moment when an action takes place. Well, this has led him to consider accountability for an act. As he points out, in our current justice system, the court rules on whether a person is capable of knowing the difference between right and wrong at the time when they commit an act. And this decision determines the punishment for individuals who have done violent acts. As the professor points out, the basis for this process of analysis of accountability in the criminal code dates from a single case in the 1840s. So this raises the question of whether the law is reflecting our current understanding of neurology. If the origination of an act comes about in a part of the brain that cannot consciously be controlled, who then is to be blamed for wrongdoing? When he looks at our criminal laws and regulations, he calls for major reforms. He compares the wholesale imprisonment of thousands of individuals to a scenario where the mechanics of the braking system of my car fails and I impose justice. I park the car in the garage and lock the door to punish the car for having that defect. Well, his advice is that we should try to fix the problem, deal with the failure of an individual to maintain an honest and just way of action. If it can be fixed, then let that be our legal response rather than merely locking people away for decades. So what is the Buddhist teaching that has a parallel to this neuroscience study? The philosophical texts provide us with the word that means without concept, kalpana apoda. This is used to describe a moment, that moment when we perceive the world. This moment of perception, this act of seeing is, say the Buddhist, without concept. It is another way of saying that there are actions 
both mental and physical, which are not the result of conscious thought. The coining of this compound followed the long-standing position in Buddhism that there is a type or a form of awareness that is non-conceptual. This is what is in operation. When we swing the tennis racket or slam on the brakes before we can even think to do so. So in the same way that Professor Sapolsky rejects the idea that anxious action is started by a conscious thought, the Buddhist thinkers had also observed this to be the case. They carried this insight a step further and used it to deny the idea that there is an individual personality controlling the initiation of events. That is why they assert that at the moment of the initiation of an act of perceiving the world, that moment is devoid of any concept that is conscious thought. What we experience as individual personality, that is ourselves, only occurs in the dynamic that happens after, after the mind processes input from perception. I see the tennis event as being directed by my skill and my presence on the court. And so it is, except the neurological reality that is taking place is not what I feel and what I see. Any skill and action that occurs when the signal comes to take my swing at the ball is caused by embodiments of experience that are not in conscious thought. Now, Moshe Sigfi puts forth a somewhat different picture. He points out that even those parts of the brain that are at play when an act occurs can over time be altered by our experience. So in one way, the question is, why is it that we even have such a faculty as conscious thought? if it's meaningless. Nature does not tend to focus on anything which has no functional role in, in survival. Buddhism teaches that karma, action, is the result of an endless numbers of conditions that come to a moment of sufficiency. That is a moment of acting thinking, speaking. And the embodied conditions for these three functions of the body at that moment are sufficient to initiate the act. And so we say a word, think a thought, move the body. Professor Sigfa maintains that these conditions are subject to change. And the process by which these alterations occur can include conscious thought. One of the ways in which the limbic system can receive new ways of operating can be found in simulation. 
Now, training a pilot is often started in a simulator. And for part of the training, the simulator is just as effective as the physical act. Athletes are now being trained to visualize moving the body in a way that results in the desired physical act. Divers in the Olympics can increase their scores by imagining themselves performing a perfect maneuver over and over. So if you do to have an interview for a job, it helps if you have mentally imagined yourself being a success. I see this in the Tibetan exercises that visualize elaborate transformations of the body and mental states. Meditation or mindfulness have been shown to be effective in altering behavior. In Theravada, the practice of seeing, visualizing oneself, expressing loving kindness has an effect on future action. These are examples of conscious thought altering neurological, physical processes. It raises a question of whether visualizing suicide and anger in computer games and videos may result in future behavior of the young people witnessing simulations of such events. In such practices, conscious thought and practices are shown to change the biology of the limbic system. So just as my distant ancestors over time altered their genetic formation by how they lived and survived. All of us are at this very moment of living, making a difference in how our limbic system is going to develop. Conscious thought may not operate as once thought. It is not the immediate cause of action but it is of importance. As I now deserve, observe the cultural and social developments in the 2010s and 2020s, I'm surprised to find that the emerging neuroscience data has in fact become the strongest support for saying there's no free will, there's no place for conscious thought of an autonomous agent in the initiation of an action. While this assertion is similar to the ancient teachings of Buddhism, is it going to be possible to find acceptance of such views among people born in the 20th and 21st centuries. Can this, can this teaching ever become acceptable to those who prize having a fully developed sense of self? What role can a doctrine have that rejects an essential selfhood? Now these questions are especially important in the current era. Our cultures give high value to individualism and concepts of free will and entitlement. It is incumbent on Buddhists to show that while our action is initiated by what is embodied in our mind and body, that embodiment can be changed through such practices as meditation, visualization, and giving thought to what we want 
for the future. In this, this very moment, we are having an impact on the factors that are embodied within our ever-changing body. So allowing ourselves to focus on anger, envy, and revenge is a serious matter. These thoughts are influencing the elements of our brain that will initiate action in the future. Thoughts, both good and bad, helpful or destructive, tied, if they're tied to the idea of a permanent self that is in control, they will forever obscure reality. Only as we accept the nature of our mental faculties and remove the idea of an autonomous self that is, as we say, calling the shots, can we come closer to the moment when we are fully aware of the reality in which we exist? Now that reality seems to be at, that at the moment an action starts, the act has not come about through my conscious thought or a self that is in control. At the same time, the functions of my brain that do start the act are not separated from the conscious thought that comes after an act. Now, Buddhist practices of mindfulness, ritual visualizations, focused chanting have been developed to aid in making a difference to this embodied limbic system. Well, I know all this sounds very complicated, perhaps unhelpful. However, we need to understand as clearly as we can what happens to us at the moment just before we think, speak, and move. This awareness is nothing less than enlightenment. Thank you. Thank you, Lou, uh, for, an, for the outstanding lecture on self. And thanks for sharing a scientific perspective on self. It's truly really amazing. And uh, we really need some time to digest <laughs> your lecture. Um, so here uh, begins our question to session. Uh, please write your question in the chat box. And the first question, uh, the rejection of a permanent self as the agent of sensory or mental activity pose a significant challenge for the early Buddhist. If there is no agent and if, no, if actions are merely transient events arising within the continuum of causally interconnected states, then how is the efficiency of karma or river to be explained? Oh, thank you. Um, so every, every time in this paper where I, or lecture where I used act, you could put the word karma. That's what karma means. It's an act. It's action. So we do have action. Nothing I've said denies that. What I've been trying to focus on is what is it that initiates the act? And when does that initiation 
occur? And where does it occur in the brain? It does not occur in the part of the brain that has consciousness, conscious thought. It happens in that other part, the limpid system. So karma is very important. Our karma that we are all doing right now, we are acting, thinking. Act, thinking is an act, it's part of karma. We're doing it right now. And that action that we are doing right now is affecting our limbic system and will eventually affect what we are experiencing when we start an act. That's why you cannot live with having conscious thought that is hating and anger and envy and jealousy and we're doing terrible damage to ourselves when we do that terrible damage our limbic system is being totally affected and it will affect how we do acts in the future so i think all of this has to do with karma thank you thank you uh, there's some questions on the chat box. I will pass. Um, I see a question about this. The any question? English thing. Uh, you gonna slip back down to that one? English one. You just say see what that one is. Uh, so let's start from the uh, Raymond. Uh, question from Raymond. Professor Mark Zuckerberg saying meta version will be a mainstream reality in five to 10 years time. What are your thoughts on the impact on humanity living virtually artificial? Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, um, Mark, I, th I think we have always been living in a meta verse. From the moment we're born, our brains give us a virtual reality. That's what we live with all the time. We, we live with, with a constructed experience. I think that I'm really seeing you on, on the screen here. But the screen is not inside my head. The only thing that made it back into my body was just the light reflecting from the screen. So the question of what will artificial intelligence and the use of the computers, they, they are going to change the way we act, no question about it. So therefore, we all need to say as much as possible, how can we make use of these technologies in a manner that will lead to the best possible results? Because if we just think that we don't have to worry about it, we can simply be unconsciously taken down into a swirl of experience, which we will find very unproductive, I think. I know it doesn't answer the question, but best I can do. Thank you. And thank you, Lou. Next question from Chuck. If this information became more widely understood, do you think it would help us to take ourselves less seriously and begin to develop more cooperative agreements? Well, let's look at it this way. I've, I've described this to you. Probably some of you feel I don't get it. 
I don't understand what he's talking about. And don't worry, I, I hardly understand what I'm talking about either, so it's okay. We're all in this together. And that's the issue. We are all in it together. If this is happening to me, it's happening to you. And if I know what's happening to me, I will know what's happening to you too. We're humans. And the more we know about what's happening, really happening to each other, I think the better we can communicate and be together. It's when we don't understand or we don't see the mechanism or we don't understand the reality that we are living that we run into a lot of trouble because we make projections and we make assumptions about what's real and true and if they are not, if that's not the case, we're causing the potential for a lot of damage and a lot of misunderstanding. So I don't know that it will say that I'm going to take myself more seriously um, or less seriously. All I'm striving for is I would like to know what's happening. I would like to know what's happening. And if I could know what's happening, I think that I would be better able in my conscious thoughts, in my daily life, to live it in a better fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Next question from Danny Tam. Since mind and experience are the factor embodied within the ever-changing body, so does our 15-year-old body and mind are the same as I am now. Buddhism teach, teaches about no, non-self. So who is the self reincarnated? Well, um, I believe that one of the greatest um, degree of lack of knowledge is the idea that I'm very much the same that I was when I was 16. I feel that I'm thinking much like I did when I was 15, 16. I've just kept being who I am through the years, unchanging. <laughs> And of course, it's all nonsense. None of us are like we were when we were 15. None of us. Not a, you cannot find anybody who can give you any proof that that's the case. Now, is there a connection to who I was, so-called who, in, when I was 15? Of course. That's the Buddhist concept of cause and conditions. And that cause and condition chain takes me all the way back to my ancestors in Scotland and England. Takes me all the way back to the first human even, if you will. Sure, we have a connection, but it's not identical. And what you were and what I was when this class started I'm no longer identical to that. I'm not identical anymore. So again, it's trying to understand what is happening to me. What really is happening? What really occurs when I think a thought? When I start an action? When I feel envy? when I feel compassion. I think that's what I'm seeking for in all these talks. Thank you, Luke. Uh, because of a limited time, so we will only take a few, one or two more questions. Uh, 
sorry for that. There's right. one person from uh, Kenji Sensei, uh, Sensei from Japan. Do words such as our heart, mind, spirit, and soul from form part of our consciousness? In other words, is the mind created by our brain? I know this is that old argument about the brain and the mind. Are they one and the same? Is there a difference? And it's a very complex issue. What we experience is, is, is controlled, and the Buddhists feel this too. What we experience is controlled by the brain and by our senses and our eyes and our ears and our nose and our tongue. We have limitations to what we can experience. Now, if I visualize or if I enter into another state, can I go beyond my senses and have an extra sensory perception? And that, that's, that's a topic that would take a whole other <laughs> lecture series. But it's a very good question. So keep on thinking about it. Uh, last question uh, from Marisa. I was confused on the American South Scotland student study. Those who did not experience rudeness growing up would have more raised blood pressure after being pushed. Where the other student who have had more rudeness growing up just adapted or did they start already with high blood pressure? This is, <laughs> sorry. See, what, 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 I, what I think from that research is this, but myself, um, it's not that those of you who are not Scottish, English immigrants in the Southern part of the United States, uh, have any different functioning in your brain and embodiment that, that I do. It's just that my particular chain of cause and conditions take me back to Scotland. And it, it's not that, it seems to me that what they feel is, it is not something which I acquired because I was treated in a particular way by my parents. I got it when I was born with my genetic composition. In other words, it was, I, it, it's embodied in us because of our genetic heritage. We have all kinds of things that are embodied in us and you sometimes wonder, why am I doing this? Or why do I feel this? And my conscious mind says, I can't figure it out. I don't know why you're feeling this way. But we, we have these, this is part of our embodiment. So that's karma, if you will. I'm born with my embodiment. I'm born with it. And I will... I will live with it for the whole time that I'm alive. And in terms of reincarnation, um, I'll, I'll refer you back to the lecture I gave on it because it's a very complicated issue too. Uh, and, but the, it's not that those people who are not in the South were got what they got in this very life as such. Nor did I get what I have in just my life experiences. I got it in the embodiment which was passed to me, which we call genetic heritage. And we all got a lot of stuff that came with us. We got it. We have it. Uh, 
well, uh, our time I see is up. Uh, let me just say to all of you, thank you for sticking with us throughout this long, long series. I had no idea that the series was going to be quite so long. And I hope that I have not disrupted your lives too much by having these monthly talks for so many months. Um, at the moment, I feel I've probably told you about everything I know. <clears throat> and I think it's time to take a break. And there are going to be a lot of really wonderful talks that are still coming from U West. Stay tuned to what they're doing at U West because they have some wonderful speakers coming up and some workshops and other things which are really uh, showing the, the force of that campus and its place in the Buddhist tradition. So President Ta, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Maroj, thank you for uh, presiding and helping set these up. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Chris Johnson for doing all the stuff behind the scenes that makes it so easy for me to give these talks. Without his help, it would have been extremely difficult. And thanks to all of you for sharing. I really appreciate your coming and being a part of this. So I wish you all the best for the new year. May you have a wonderful and joyous and productive life ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. Thank you, Brother. Thank, Thank you, Lou. And today, all 2021 guest lecture series came to end. I'm happy to announce that we have invited an incredible lineup of guest speaker for next spring, uh, spring semester 2022. Some of the guest speakers are Venable Huitong, Abbot Sila Temple, Thanissaro Bhikkhu, Abbot Wat Meta, San Diego, Dr. Miranda Saha, Associate Professor of Religion at the University of Richmond, Dr. Charles D. Simoni, Kent University. So please stay tuned. At last, thank you everyone for attending this lecture series and thank President Ta, Dr. Geneva Mura, Dr. Jen Yang Ranke, Christopher Johnson, Venable D, Venable Srinanda, and Fong Sam for their support. I hope you all have a joyful holiday season and a happy new year. Thank you.